Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Bachner. I'm back after being away for a week and um, I'm here with probably my favorite guest, Zeke Emanuel. Zeke is the Diane S. Levy and Robert M. Levy University Professor, Professor of Healthcare Management, University of Pennsylvania, where he's Vice Provost for Global, Global Initiatives and Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. Welcome, Zeke. It's great to be here, and thanks for the uh, flattering comment. Well, uh, I won't take it to heart, but I'll tell my mom to listen. Oh, uh, you can take it to heart. Uh, you have such, you have just a really fine mind, so I always appreciate it. Well, uh, thank you. So, be wide ranging, Zeke. But let's start. You know, before we came on, I mentioned. You know, have we become immune to the number of deaths? I, I count one hundred seventy thousand deaths, a thousand a day to the end of the year gives a three hundred thousand. And then the estimate is that about 50% more are COVID-related, but not COVID-counted. That, that brings us almost to a half a million deaths. H have we just become immune to it? Uh, yes. I do think the fact that we're, that we're not shocked every day that we're losing 1,000 people, uh, that somehow we can dismiss it as, oh, the, just the elderly or something, which is totally false. Uh, has made us somewhat uh, immune. And we know, uh, inured as you say, we know that you know something happens over and over again, you sort of block it out. But to put in context, half a million deaths uh, is a little under a, a increase in 20% of all deaths every year. So we have about 2.7, uh, 2.8 million deaths in the United States. And again, even among those deaths, 75% of them are uh, in people over 65, uh, they're seniors. Uh, but you know, 500,000 is a very whopping chunk of that from one illness that you know began killing Americans in late February. Uh, and I do think uh, we've lost sight of how powerful that is. Uh, you know, as you said, a thousand people a day is, you know, a plane full of 300 people, uh, three of them dropping out of the air every day. That, that would shock us if we actually stood, stood, uh, stepped back or a thousand people dying from a hurricane. That's a shocking number. Yeah, I, I see the number see every morning point. and I'm just amazed. That, as I said, I, I think we've become almost immune to it. Uh, so, I also think early or early yeah. in the this epidemic, people had no idea when when I began talking, you know, months ago about we're going to have a quarter of a million deaths by November. People were like, no, you know, you're exaggerating. And that's like, yeah, that's easily going to be the number right. uh, by November 1st, Election yeah. Day. Um, so many different issues have come up. Um, schools have become a nightmare. Uh, uh, I think, you know, we published an important article, schools closed, uh, mortality uh, went, went down, um, parents are divided. Uh, it's been difficult for teachers, I, I fully recognize it, but everyone keeps saying the same thing for young children, uh, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, not to be in school, kind of Zooming education just may not work very well. What's your sense? Is there, will we ever get back to school this year? physically get well, back to school. For, first of all, Howard, I like to put this in context of, you know, it's not like the United States is the only country confronting the issue of school openings. Yeah. Um, lots of other countries have done school openings, you know, whether it's uh, Finland uh, or Belgium or the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, certainly. Um, so you have a lot of experience about opening schools uh, and it can be done safely. Uh, we've had one major other country that has opened and it's not been, gone well. How much that was schools, how much that was other things happening in the environment, that's Israel. Um, uh, so we can do it well. But before you can do it, you have to have a low rate of transmission in the community. Um, and that's been the fundamental issue is we don't have enough people or not for the population, enough states where we have a low rate of transmission in the community that would permit opening of in-person education. Uh, so I think that's what is critical. Uh, we have to get the rate of transmission down, the number of new cases down, and then we can you know, talk about it. There are places in the United States where you can discuss uh, reasonably reopening in-person education. You've come from one of them, 
Maine, I think there are, you know, over a seven day period, there are like 11 cases of uh, COVID in the state. All right. That means that you're having, you know, call it two new cases per 100,000 people per day. Um, That's a number that you can open schools with, uh, especially if you have a testing capacity that has, you know, a positivity rate under three, certainly under five, yes. And um, I think those are the numbers we need to have to talk about reopening schools. So New York City, it turns out, yeah. you know, its problem, it, it, it could have reopened given the, the numbers of new cases and testing capacity or testing percentage positivity. The problem in New York is you don't have the infrastructure. You don't have outdoor spaces where you can hold classrooms and space people out. Um, and that, I think, makes it hard in the city. Probably in the surrounding suburbs, it's going to be doable. Lots of Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, as, a, as we said, Maine. Um, you can open schools in, if not all, every county or every school, uh, a lot of those areas. On the other hand, clearly Texas, which is leads the list again at, at nearly 200 cases per 100,000 over a seven-day period, it, it makes no sense to open up in-person education. Uh, so I think that's a serious problem. So the first question any parent ought to ask is, what's the daily transmission rate per 100,000 in our, our community? Is it low enough that it, we can safely reopen schools? Uh, the early experiences with colleges haven't gone very well. Uh, many have retreated from in-person opening. Uh, some delayed the decision, then some opened, and the early experience hasn't yeah. gone well. I think some college communities are saying a little nervous about bringing 19, 20, 21 year olds. We both have children older than that and how responsibly they'd behave. Any sense about college, Zeke? Yeah, I well, I've spent a lot of time advising of both my own and, and other colleges. And it, it the problem is uh, what students do, especially if they're off campus. Uh, but how much socializing they're doing, how adherent to the safety practices, wearing face masks, staying six feet apart, uh, they are. And it does appear that they're not actually adhering to them, uh, whether it's at, uh, you know, fraternity sororities or other parties uh, they or bars that are near campus. It does seem that uh, these the necessary rules to keep the uh, any COVID transmission to a minimum just aren't being adhered to. And that's the real problem. Uh, they're not being socially responsible. Um, you know, I have uh, uh, talked to my alma mater, Amherst College, about reopening. They're going to reopen with uh, the plan is with about half of students on campus. Uh, they tested the faculty and staff and uh, almost a thousand tests, all negative. Um, but they're worried about a few students who are renting houses off campus to avoid the uh, strictures of living on campus. And, and that is the worry that pe- they're going to throw parties there. And uh, I think that's a very sad commentary on how we've not inculcated in people social responsibility, responsibility for others, actually adhering to rules. Um, you know, that we expect those kind of behaviors. I, I don't know. It's, it's a little sad that that's what, you know, our image of college life is and therefore uh, what we've communicated to students uh, uh, about their responsibility. What's gone well? What's gone well? Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think we have to be wildly impressed uh, by the vaccine uh, action. Um, uh, you know, the uh, number of uh, shots on goal, as you say, you know, number of potential candidate vaccines, vaccines that rapidly entered humans trial that we're now got, uh, I think it's seven in phase three yep. trial. That is pretty impressive. Uh, you have to be wowed by the scientific prowess that represents. Uh, um, second is, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the British effort with creating large, simple, randomized trials to test out therapeutics, I think that's been impressive. They got it up and running uh, in March and uh, quickly were able to generate uh, thousands upon thousands of people randomized uh, and get evidence right away of uh, what's working, what's not working. Um, And I do think in certain pockets of uh, the country, um, 
where, you know, the governors, the mayors have spoken with one voice, a consistent voice. Uh, I think uh, people wearing masks, adhering to social distancing, you have seen, and New York is a very good yeah. example, you've seen a dramatic decline and a persistent decline. You haven't seen a, a second bounce. We will see a second bounce. That's inevitable. Uh, but I do think that it shows that the public health measures work. You don't need a no, um, magic uh, 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 pharmaceutical or vaccine yet. You can get the numbers down low with the public health measures, and they can stay low. You need good leadership for that. You need consistent messaging. Uh, but uh, the public is willing to listen, and I think that's been a positive sign. And I will say we've learned a lot about the um, negative effects of opening indoor dining, indoor yeah, bars, bars yeah. indoor gyms right away. And I think one of our problems is we got into this open closed, you know, no, it's phased opening and only some things are going to be open. Not every non-essential business is going to be open. And I think we'll in many places we lost sight of that. Um, I saw a statistics uh, or heard a statistic from the uh, public health person in Los Angeles saying that the day they opened indoor dining and bars, they have 10 million residents in L.A. 500,000 of them went to restaurants, bars and other locations. And it's like, you want to know why you had a, a resurgence? Yeah. You know, it doesn't take a, a genius to figure it out there. And uh, those should be among the last places open. And yet. Because for all sorts of reasons, quite understandable, but not good, uh, they were among the first to be reopened, and that was a mistake. The, the other thing that I, I actually think we've done well, because the epidemiology was so clear by March or April, uh, you really yeah. have to protect the elderly. It's unbelievable. I, I mean, their mortality rate, once you're 65, 70, 75, or 80, is just enormous. And I do think we've done a really good job in protecting the elderly over the last couple months. And I, I think you see it in the ratio of number of cases to deaths, which is much lower than it had been. So I do think that is the one thing that we, we've learned and we've done relatively good at. I, but I, the number of cases in the young people has gone up. Yeah, it's, got, it's, it's skyrocketing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no, we had, I, I, I do think that is true. We did learn who was vulnerable and I think moved relatively expeditiously uh, uh, in that direction. I, I want to go back to vaccines. I, I, I think, um, you know, there's been a uh, we've published a, a major study from China, phase three. There's been others in, in the uh, other major journals, the more experimental uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, they're all early uh, optimism uh, by everyone. Um, you and Paul Offit, who I've also interviewed, had a, a piece uh, in The New York Times uh a few weeks ago about the so-called October surprise. I've, I've interviewed yeah. Steve Hahn, who I was incredibly impressed with, about the me mechanism for vaccine approval, uh, w whether or not uh, EUA, emergency use authorization, will be used, how transparent they will be with the data, will they allow the external advisory board to really drive the final decision uh, by the FDA? How are you thinking about it? Well, um I have great respect for Steve Hahn. Uh, I think he is uh, uh, a man who wants to do the right thing. Um, I think he's under tremendous pressure from everyone, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. And I think until you've sat in the decision-making chair of a federal uh, 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 bureaucrat who has to make a critical decision, you can't understand all the political pressures. But, you know, there are literally lives at stake in whether you approve something or not. There's the trust in the vaccine process. There's all the political pressure that's going to be brought to bear on him. Um, I don't envy him one iota. Um, and I do think he has tried to make clear that his North Star is going to be, you know, we need the data uh, and we need to have, you know, the scientific evaluation be proper and careful. And I think, you know, uh, I'm feeling better about it. Um, knowing how much pressure there can be, I can't say that I'm 100% confident that there's going to be no shenanigans here. But, um, you know, with his hand on the tiller and, and being forewarned about what might happen if it, the science doesn't drive this, I, I, I'm very confident. I, I have been struck that the scientific community 
uh, uh, the medical community has spoken with a single voice about this, that, that oh, yeah. everyone needs to see the data. There needs to be transparency. He has to bring in the co uh, consultants that generally uh, advise uh, the FDA. As I said, he's written for us, and I, I did a live, uh, a live stream with him. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping he's able to resist. If there are political pressures, um, I'm hoping he can resist them and that a decision about a vaccine in October before the election will be based upon evidence and, and nothing else. You're an ethicist by training. I think sometimes people forget that because you live in a world of health policy. <laughs> You've raised concerns about ethical distribution of vaccines both in the United States and around the world. Mm. It's been a remarkable phenomena of development. I think the U.S.'s commitment is up to five, ten, or fifteen billion dollars in procuring early delivery of vaccines, uh, supporting the development of the ability to produce it before we even know if it's going to be successful. It's very different than any other. Uh, time in my life around vaccine development, procurement, distribution. First, let's talk about the U.S. What do you think will happen in the U.S. if there is a successful vaccine? Then let's talk about the world. Well, look, I think inevitably, uh, Howard, one of the problems is you're not going to have enough vaccine out of the box. So even with the advanced purchases, even with some of the vaccines being relatively easy to produce, um, you're only going to have tens and maybe under optimal circumstances, 100 million doses, you know, call it before the end of the year. Um, you know, 100 million doses is really good, but it still represents a third of the population of the United States. It's not enough for herd immunity, even under the more recent revised calculations, which I have to say I'm somewhat skeptical of, right. uh, where we only need 45 to 50 percent of the population right. vaccinated for herd immunity. So. You know, it, it, you're going to have to prioritize, and I think that's going to be a difficult uh, ethical decision. Uh, one thing I, I would say is that in that prioritization, we have to keep our eye on the ball. And I think people are misinterpreting the ball here. So the primary goal is, I think, to reduce uh, premature mortality of people. Um, now, a lot of people assume, oh, well, that means healthcare workers get it first, and then the uh, people who are uh, uh, at highest risk get it first. That may not be true. That may not be the best way to reduce premature mortality. It may be better uh, to, for example, uh, immunize people who are at high risk of transmitting the virus, both because of jobs, living situations, and other circumstances. Um, and that I think, you know, we have to leave an open mind and look at uh, some detailed modeling about what the best way is to reduce um, uh, the premature mortality. And that, you know, we should not rush, rush to an assumption about, you know, it's high risk people that need to get the vaccine first. Um, so I, I do think that's uh, going to be critically important uh, in thinking about who gets the vaccine uh, initially and, you uh, you know, it may or may not be healthcare workers. Certainly at uh, uh, Penn, um, we've seen the transmission among healthcare workers now that everyone knows how to don and right, doff mass. Uh, PPE. It's basically gone to zero, uh, uh, both acquisition from patients and colleagues. And, you know, so I don't know that health, frontline healthcare workers are necessarily <laughs> the first uh, ought to be necessarily at the highest priority, given that they can don and off uh, PPE uh, effectively. Payment going to be an issue in the U.S., Seek? Well, the government has said it's going to pay for it. Okay. Um, and so it, it's acquiring all the doses and going to distribute them. That's like when what we did under H1N1. I might say that, you know, just having the vaccine and actually having it produced is not uh, that's necessary, but not sufficient. You actually have to put it in vials. You have to fill, finish it in a yeah, sterile correct. fashion. You actually have to have enough uh, syringes and needles. We t take all of this for granted, but I don't think we've had a uh, any case where we're planning to do, call it 250 or 300 million people, not once, because the, the uh, actually vaccines that are going to get approved out of the box are almost all going to be two shotters. Um, you're going to need two doses separated by three to four weeks. And I think that's, you know, not a good, uh, you know, 
there could be a lot of bottlenecks there. And I don't think the, as far as we can tell, and we did a report for the Center for American Progress on this, that the administration has well worked out each one of the potential steps. So that worries me as well, that we're, we're going to find ourselves, yes, we can produce the vaccines, but guess what? Um, you know, getting them into vials, shipped out, distributed, and into people's arms, those, each one of those steps are prone to, to a, a bottleneck. Uh, WHO is trying to raise 15 to $20 billion for world purchase of uh, vaccines and then sort through an e ethical approach to distribution. Um, right. Uh, let's take, put the money aside. Let, let's say you could give the WHO a billion doses, uh, 500 million doses. Where do we go from there? Well, you know, they, they seem at the moment to be under extreme pressure to distribute it based upon population to make sure that every country gets it. And that does fulfill one important ethical principle, which is uh, equal concern for countries. Uh, but it fails the principle I mentioned before that you really want to minimize premature deaths on the notion that, uh, you know, death is uh, t a total deprivation um, and you can't compensate people for it. Uh, and it's uh, very severe. Um, uh, so if you want to minimize the harm of premature death, you don't actually distribute it evenly among countries. You concentrate on countries that at the moment when you have the vaccine have severe, the severe hot spots um, and where the vaccine is going to make the biggest difference in terms of reducing premature death. And uh, so I think I, I see a tension uh, in uh, their current thinking from where uh, what I think the ethical approach is. Will uh, the U.S., Germany, Japan, the wealthy countries get vaccine first? Uh, almost inevitably, they're going to get vaccine first. The, I think the real question is, is there going to be enough extra to make sure that uh, it's fairly and equitably distributed, that there's enough for uh, low and middle income countries? Uh, now, uh, you know, the negative thing is that there's a a lot of pressure for vaccine nationalism. We saw this, you know, and the United States on this is not unique. You know, France, when Sanofi announced that it was going to send the first doses to the United States, France went berserk. Uh, the French population went berserk. Um, you know, wait, this is a French company. It's a, we've supported you all these years, and now the U.S. is going to get the fruits here. Um, so, you know, we need to recognize this as a very common human instinct, um, uh, and I think that there are actually good ethical reasons for it. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there is this effort by the WHO, Gavi and CEPI to create this pool of money. They will be able to buy some vaccine. In addition, you know, some va major vaccine manufacturers such as AstraZeneca have pledged to distribute the vaccine fairly and equitably. And so uh, I do think we have uh, a, a reasonably good chance of having a fair number of doses that will be distributed among low and middle income countries that, uh, you know, if left to market forces would not be available. Uh, China's played an interesting role. We uh, published a phase two study uh, about a week or 10 days ago. It's more of a traditional vaccine. It appears to have lower yeah. adverse of events than, than the other vaccines. Uh, they're moved rapidly into phase three, given their population, I suspect, they, were, they may easily report out phase three data uh, first. Um, the Chinese always seem to have an interesting world policy. They've invested around the world in different ways. Can you imagine them being the world provider of vaccine? Well, again, part of the issue of traditional vaccines is the production process, um, a little more challenging than the uh, RNA uh, vaccines. Um, and so that may turn out to be uh, a rate limiting factor. But I think, uh, frankly, they're more likely to use it in a political fashion. And I think we should, you know, see that for what it is. Um, I, I, as you know, Howard, one of the things I like to do is uh, read and think about history. Right. You know, one of the great American achievements, maybe one of the greatest in the 20th century, and we had a number of them, was landing a man on the moon. And what differentiated our program from the Russian program was our transparency and the notion that we weren't pounding our chest, we're doing it for America, but that this was a world 
a human achievement. Um, and I think we need to have that expansive view uh, on this vaccine issue because uh, it really has to be a world uh, view. Uh, remember, we can immunize the United States, but it ain't returning to normal if the rest of the world yeah, right. doesn't have vaccine, right? I mean, you can see what's happened in New Zealand, right? They were in some ways sterile. They had, I think, a more than 100 days of no cases. Right, 107 then, days, right. You know, what, what do you get? You know, <laughs> so it comes in from outside because the rest of the world isn't that way. If we want to return to normalcy, where normalcy includes air travel, it includes communication with other countries, really open borders. Um, you got to get this vaccine around the world and not just to the United States or not just to a few, handful of developed countries. And I think that's got to be our approach and that's got to be our direction. It's going to be good for us and good for the world. And sort of having a very narrow minded self-interest uh, I think is not going to be good for the United States. Bob Redfield, Tony Fauci, many others have really talked about the tremendous concerns about the fall. I um, mean, we're still at 40, 50, 60,000 cases nationwide. We really would like to be under per 10 day. per day. Sorry, per day. Um, I mean, Bob couldn't have been clearer. And Tony, social distance mask, we have to get under 10,000 cases per day throughout the U.S. I know there's pockets. Flu comes in the fall. We have to have a massive flu vaccination campaign. Uh, any sense, any crystal ball of how it's going to play out in the fall, Zeke? I, I agree with them. I've been worried about the fall from day one. And I think our early evidence that when you open up indoor bars, indoor restaurants, and et cetera, that you get these resurgences uh, has to make you worried <laughs> Yeah. about the fall when things get cold forget flu for a second when things get cold now add on flu another respiratory uh, virus um, and you have a serious problem and add on the fact that we have a vaccine but typically in a typical year only 45 percent of adults get right. vaccinated and our usual many of our usual sites of vaccination the workplace schools are going to be absent we're not going to be able to vaccinate people through those mechanisms. It is really worrisome. We could use, right? We have flu vaccine is available today. I know because on Monday I got my shot, right? Two days ago, I got my vaccine, my flu vaccine. We could, could have used, if we have thought about it, this moment early in the uh, late summer, early fall, to try out a new vaccine strategy, our expanded vaccine access. If, you know, the administration had planned, okay, in March, we're going to have a vaccine sometimes. We're going to have to actually, because we're going to administer to hundreds of millions of Americans, we're going to have to have a new administration infrastructure. Let's test it out and give it a dry run on flu. We haven't done that, but we should begin doing that because it's going to be necessary. I, I have long been an advocate of uh, mandatory uh, vaccination. Uh, certainly for under 18, we can mandate uh, flu vaccines, um, I think, relatively easily. Um, I think, you know, even for adults uh, and presumably a lot of employers will require this. Um, it'll enhance the number who get it. But given the unemployment rate and other things, it still won't be universal. We do need to have everyone get a flu vaccine if they can um, and uh, expanded vaccination infrastructure. The sort of patchwork we've had a few people at CBS and Walgreens and Walmart, some at the doctor's office, some at that. That's just going to make it hard, especially on, on COVID, where we need to give people two. And we know a lot of people will forget or a lot of people will, you know, ignore it, not have the time, whatever it is. Drug stores, grocery stores drive up. Uh, vaccination. We have drive up testing. I mean, when yeah. when you think about a different type of delivery system and I like the idea, try it for flu. If it works, you can then duplicate, d duplicate it l later on. W what would you envision would be a, a kind of an efficient way? Because, you know, like the AMA essentially is closed. You can't pre you can't do it at work. No one's coming to work. Right. And right. then you have 30 right. million unemployed. So unemployment and not people not coming to work workplaces aren't going to do it you can't you can't get to the doc's office without pcr testing 
So that won't be an effective um, model. W when you say a new system, what, what, what do you envision, Zeke? So one, if, if I were uh, Vaccines are. I'll make you vaccines are. No, I don't want to be vaccine. Just think about the mayor of a city, uh. right? You've got, you bring in the heads of the, your healthcare systems, you bring in your pharmacies, um, you carve up the city, and you basically say, all right, guys, you're responsible for these blocks, right? Uh, you know, we don't really care whether they're your patients or not. You create an electronic platform so everyone can report. Yeah. Um, and then you get the city covered by the infrastructure you have. Um, and I think that is the important, uh, that would be the important approach. You know, lots of other countries actually have people go to people's houses to give vaccines. And I do remember my father as a pediatrician in the 60s doing that, going to kid who, kids who couldn't come in for whatever reason and give vaccines, uh, go to their house and make a house call and, and give, the va give vaccines. I think we need to think about that model today especially because as I, it's the second shot that really worries me. Getting people in the first time, sure. Uh, but the second, you know, maybe they get a little pain, it's inconvenient, all sorts of things can make it hard to get that second shot. And so we need to, you know, marshal all the resources, um, have them in, in an organized fashion and assign responsibilities and make sure that they get the people, uh, uh, you know, vaccinated who they're responsible for. Um, but I think breaking it up by geography, assigning geographies to whether it's health system or stores or whatever, uh, pharmacies is probably uh, uh, the way I would go at the local level. I've always said I thought nationally, the you know, go ahead nationally. Nationally, they're not going to have responsibility. They're going to basically have the we can supply you and we can make sure that right. the supplies get to you, but they don't have. Uh, the government, federal government doesn't have the capacity to actually administer this. It's interesting. I always thought that the hardest medical job in America was to be FDA director. Uh, I, I thought for the last couple of months it was probably Dr. Fauci's position. I, I think the hardest medical job in America for the last six months has been being a mayor of a, of a big city. It's, it's, I feel for every one of the mayors who were thrust into these enormously complicated decisions with experts disagreeing, uh, uh, not a lot of certainty about what to do. So I, I really feel like uh, the mayors of the major cities, it's been a, a very, very difficult six months and they're not going to have a lot of money come the fall, which will be in a- Right. Uh, and, and, and Howard, they don't, they control some variables, but right. they don't control a lot of the right. big variables. So you're responsible without all of the capacity to answer like, getting PPE, getting ventilators, hospital surge capacity. So it, it, I do think it's been a very challenging uh, time. I want to return to one or two scientific questions. So, you know, the recovery trial really championed steroids. Now there's a number of other uh, steroid trials that will be reported out in the coming in the coming days, which is good. Remdesivir had some p positive effects, not overwhelming. Um, and I think there'll be some additional remdesivir trials, many other trials ongoing. But uh, the new kid on the block uh, was this morning, yesterday, and the day before, convalescent plasma, 30, 35,000 patients treated with it. Um, it went up on a preprint server. And then, according at least to a report this morning, doctors Collins and Fauci have expressed their concern that the observational data is not very clear. Um, a sense of, of convalescent plasma, how this is just playing out, uh, Zeke? <laughs> it shows you can get a lot of people, but not have a well-designed study. Um, I have to agree with uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, and, you know, I, I just don't understand the study. You have no placebo control group here. So what are we supposed to make of this? They wanted to have a sort of difference in difference by how long it got delayed that people got it and then convinced themselves that, you know, if they got it later and it didn't make as good a, a fact that, you know, that was sufficient proof. I, I don't think so. And first, the, and so the impact, you know, you, you don't know how to understand it because how you decide or how it was decided when people get it is very subjective. And one of the subjective factors may be who's likely to do better and who's likely to do worse and you can't control for that. Uh, and so 
I think it, I think the data are ha very hard to interpret, and it's certainly I think impossible to make a definitive judgment on whether to recommend this stuff. You know, if it were free, all right, but it isn't free. <laughs> um, it's expensive, hospital based. I have to say, one of the things that does concern me, Howard, about a lot of the opening trials is um, that they're not easy. Uh, uh, things to administer right. or cheap, right? We're going to now have monoclonal antibodies. Right. Great. You're not going to, hard to produce, hard to produce in large quanti quantities like remdesivir, and they're going to be pretty expensive uh, and institutional based uh, therapies. We need things that are much cheaper. You know, if we, you know, get dexamethasone early on and it does have uh, kind of the similar effects as. Uh, it did on uh, critically ill patients. Uh, that's a cheap, you know, oral medication. Uh, that's a very different scenario. But I think, you know, one of the disappointing thing factors to me is a lot of the these early trials are going to report very uh, expensive uh, items, uh, interventions that for uh, that have to be administered in hospitals. Uh, maybe financially lucrative, but is not the kind of thing that can be scaled uh, effectively or easily, it seems to me. And certainly uh, can't be used in the prophylactic or for mild cases. Right. The, the other issue is that many of them are struggling to enroll patients. And so many of them may, may, may end up reporting preliminary results that are underpowered, which will even make it more difficult to really understand the true impact for various reasons. Knowing what recovery did in the UK yeah. and the fact that we're underpowered on these trials when we have, you know, all these cases of right. a day throughout the country, that's disappointing. See, last last question. It's it's more of a a political question. I don't I don't think you'll be shy ab about it. This would have been difficult to, regardless of who was president. It, it really would have been. Um, you know, we're a country that has free speech when we champion it and people are allowed th their opinions. But it, we, we haven't allowed good public health measures and science to win out or it's been a struggle. Let's let's put it that way. I, I mean, I, you know, for the first time about a month ago, you know, we finally saw a fair amount of the leadership, both in Democrat, Democrat and Republicans masking, finally saying it right. needed to change. Uh, Bob Redfield on my show couldn't have been clearer. We have to socially distance. We really have to mask for six weeks. We have to get the number of daily cases down or the fall will be a nightmare. Um, you know, virtually all of the medical leadership has now spoken with a single voice, but we have struggled with the public. Is there a way to change that? Um, I think there is a way to change it, uh, but, and, you know, the CDC has known about public health communication well before COVID. They knew what worked. They had proven what worked. Uh, they had a whole manual on it, and we violated almost every one of their <laughs> requirements. You know, you have to be consistent, speak with one voice, and repeat the message over and over, and make sure that all the people who are looked up upon by society, whether they're you know, lead, political leaders, their sports stars, their movie celebrities, their other people who are just, you know, business leaders, they have to speak with the same voice and you have to get them together. The effort to create a common message and to get every one leader to speak with uh, and reinforce that common message, whether it's by Instagram or tweeting, we didn't do that. Could we do that? Well, we certainly are going to have to do it around vaccination. Mm. And I think we're going to have to, uh, you know, I hope that with the change in leadership, we'll be able to get that uh, done uh, with the federal government leading and someone at the White House calling every uh, uh, celebrity, uh, athlete, business leader, everyone they can think of to reinforce that message and reinforce it over and over. I mean, one of the other things we know from communications uh, studies is that, you know, one message isn't enough. Uh, I think it was Richard Nixon who said, you know, you say it once, you say it twice, you say it seven or eight times, you're sick of it. They're just beginning to hear it. <laughs> and I think that's that's one of the one of the things we know, you know, you have to repeat and reinforce what you're saying 
um, in many, many different venues. And in the United States these days, many, many different languages um, to many different communities with many different speakers. And uh, I think that's just going to be critical. Yes, I do think we can retain it. Are there going to be people who constantly will criticize and chirp from the sidelines? Yes, we have to make them a minority um, and marginalize them by showing that actually doing these things is effective. Um, and I think, you know, part of the problem is people put the mask on, you know, and they don't see an effect for six weeks. Yeah, right. um, and, and that that's we have to prime them for that. It's not immediate. You know, you don't put a mask on and suddenly it's gone from your COVID's gone from your community. It doesn't happen that way. And, and so they have to know what to expect. Yeah. Preventive medicine has always been difficult. Is normalcy yeah. is normalcy going to be in 2021 or not till 2022? Well, I've I've maintained November 2021. I think round about that time. So you think a year? You know, hopefully, hopefully we'll have enough normalcy so we can start the fall with in-person education and more in-person uh, opening up of uh, uh, many, many more non-essential businesses. Um, I think that's the key. And then you know when we have the 70 percent of the population or whatever the herd immunity number turns out to be. Uh, uh, immunized, uh, then, you know, that'll be round about November uh, 2021, January 1st, 2022. Uh, this is Howard Bachner. It's been conversations with Dr. Bachner, uh, my, uh, really my favorite guest, Zeke, Zeke Emanuel. He's been a member of the JAMA editorial board. He's been so helpful in educating me about so many different issues. He's the vice provost for global initiatives and chair of the Department of Medical Ethics, Health Policy at University of Pennsylvania, and the Diane S. Levy and Robert M. Levy University professor. Um, as always, thanks, thanks so much, Zeke. Thanks for having me on, Howard, and again, thanks for that compliment. Really appreciate it. Really, stay healthy. <laughs> See you. You too. Bye-bye.